Metaphysical awareness disorder is a fatal mental illness that has been making a sudden return in recent months. Right, one more. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Whoa. Climb inside the torso and accept your death. July 30th, 1999. A small film with only a budget of $60,000 premiered at the Sundance Film Festival. A horror film whose story was told through the characters found tapes. That movie was The Blair Witch Project. While not the first found footage movie made, The Blair Witch Project popularized the format of the found footage genre, leading to movies such as Paranormal Activity and the motion sickness inducing Cloverfield. Seriously, they had to have a warning at the theaters when we saw it. Fast forward to July 25th, 2019. A new wave of lost tape stories would start as Fazbear Entertainment Video Manual uploaded to Squimpus McGrimpus's YouTube channel. Since then, more and more creators would upload their own takes on the genre, ushering in the rise of analog horror. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of that Cyber Channel. I'm Dan Cyber and today we're talking about the genre that has taken over my channel for the past year. Stop! Stop! Slow the heck down. I cannot keep up. I don't have any commentary. I don't have any commentary. I don't have any commentary. I'm finally... Look, these videos were much easier than writing a full script, and I was already drowning at my day job, so... I did a lot of reactions. It's hard to go anywhere on YouTube without stumbling on at least one analog horror series. From simple one-offs to series that have been ongoing since 2015 and each day it feels like I'm being suggested a brand new analog horror series. Well, rather than simply react to them, don't worry, I still have more of those up my sleeves, I thought we'd take an in-depth look at some of the staples of the genre, a few that we've already reacted to and a few that we haven't even looked at yet. But first, if you'd like to take a stab at making your own analog horror, why not learn some animation from today's sponsor? Oh boy, it's ad time! Ah, 90s training videos. Man, do I miss them, said no one ever. Honestly, the old VHS tapes that taught us how to scrape the grill at Wendy's were full of cringe. But times have changed, and learning can be incredibly easy thanks to Skillshare. The last person you want to get work advice from is a paid actor. As a paid actor, I would know. Hold on. Skillshare classes, though, are taught by working professionals. So when you take a class on editing, you're getting a lesson from an actual editor, like Penny Lane, an award-winning documentary editor who just so happens to be teaching a class on found footage filmmaking. You can learn anything from web design to creative writing to, of course, editing. That way you can be as tired as I am when I'm finishing a video. Right now, Skillshare is hooking up the first 1,000 Cybernauts to use the code the cyber channel or the link below a full month free that's 30 days to explore any class skillshare has to offer ditch the singing burger patties and learn the creative skills you want real training video by the way look it up oh my gosh it's the end of the ad I see no better way to start this video than talking about my introduction into the genre. Let's begin with Squimpus McGrimpus. With the first upload once again happening on July 25th, 2019, the Squimpus tapes are a retelling of FNAF's one, through four. I swear, FNAF is a gateway to everything that haunts my dreams. Well, rather than trying to tell a story by hiding everything in random corners, Scott, the story is told through corporate training tapes. I mean, this assumes that the bigwigs approved tapes containing bloodied animatronics, burning corpses, and this monstrosity. I don't like you very much, sir. Not one bit. Setting that aside for a moment, I can confidently say this is the best telling of the FNAF story to date. And yes, I do include the original games in here as well. A big problem I've always had with FNAF is there is no real character in the games. No emotional stakes except for... No! Oh, yes! <laughs> ah! oh! 
Oh. Squimp is here adds that human element back in. The missing children suddenly go from just a sprite to tortured souls trying to find rest. And by rest, I do mean burning Afton to the ground. For example, security footage. This video stands out because it is so completely different from the rest. Rather than disturbing horror visuals, this entire tape is simply the spirits of Bonnie and Chica discussing the new night guard. That's it. No scares or tiny eyes and large eye sockets. This will be an ongoing tropes. We learn in this video Chica and Bonnie are haunted by brothers. Chica the younger and Bonnie the older. The only way to describe it is heartbreaking as Chica tries to comfort Bonnie. The naivety of a young child unaware of the hell he's trapped in trying to stay positive hoping for the day they can go to heaven and an older brother who understands the reality they're in and that they may never escape. Escape. This video marks a shift to much more personal themes. It's not just about spooks and the jumps and the... It's also around this time that we begin to unravel who the tapes are for. Us. Well, okay, not us as ourselves, but we begin to play the role of Michael Afton. Each video begins to share the tape's purpose. We were meant to watch these to understand what happened and how to stop our father, William Afton. It's really a strange phenomenon for us to actually be a part of the story like this. It's similar to how you feel when playing a game, just without the ability to actually impact the story. And this leads me to why this is such a perfect companion piece to FNAF. Scott never really created any characterization. Sure, there are characters, but can you truly tell me Afton's motivations in FNAF 1 through 4? Yeah, I didn't think so. But more on that in another video. Squimpus does an excellent job of adding emotion and stakes to the FNAF storyline. Had Michael been given these tapes between nights and locations, it would have enhanced the story significantly. Now, we didn't talk a whole lot about the visuals yet. I think for being one of the early adopters of FNAF Lost Tapes, things feel really simple. I mean, really, it's not far off from how FNAF felt when it first came out. Throughout the series, there is really little animation, but rather still images enhanced with effects. The simplicity the simplicity though doesn't detract from the quality though. The simple images combined with effects still feels at home in the early 90s. Beyond that, nothing much more can be said than a lot was done with just a little. And there's something really nice about that. Overall, Squimpus really set the standard for a whole lot of future analog horror. What a weird thing to say about a dead form of media. It's simple and yet incredibly impactful. It was no wonder why it popularized the genre. But Squimpus wasn't the first analog horror series to appear on the platform. Finding the first analog horror series is kinda tricky. There are tons of different horror series on YouTube, from things like the Crypt TV series to Hi, I'm Mary Mary, and while there is a case for Marble Hornets to be the first, it doesn't quite fit. Analog horror, strictly speaking, is horror told through analog mediums. VHS tapes. I'm, I'm talking about VHS tapes that I'm sure 80% of you never used. We are. With that in mind, the earliest analog horror I can find is Local 58. The first video of Local 58 was uploaded October 31st, 2017. Fun fact, that's five years ago, and time literally means nothing to me anymore. Local 58 revolves around broadcasts from a public access channel. You know, the ones playing all the greatest hits, like painting and exercising guy. Comedy gold. Each video starts off with just a simple schedule of what's coming up until rudely interrupted by an unknown entity. An entity that just simply wants us to look up. Out of everything on this list, I think this might be my favorite series. Why? I think it really simply comes down to us playing ourselves. Squimpus's videos have us function as one of the characters, but here on Local 58, we're invited to live in this unsettling environment. Rather, the world is built up around us to participate in this madness, which leads us into the world building in this one. World building is everything to the series. Since there isn't a character for the audience to attach to, the series focuses on creating the horror through an environment. Each tape makes this world more dangerous and tense to live in. It's the sort of thing that makes you go out at night and go, eh, 
Maybe I won't look at the moon today. It's all about changing your perspective on the world. The series is still ongoing with a recent transition from analog to digital. For those not as old as my boomer self, analog video through airwaves were set to be phased out in accordance with the FCC. That's just a little history for you. But what's important here is that the series has gone full ARG now. Along with the video, hints and puzzles have been buried to reveal where the story is going. I would go into it here, but honestly, we did a better job of it over on Film Theory, so you know, watch that after this video. Local 58 really stands out in this list for relying on the world building instead of character. Here, it really pays off. But wonder if you were to take this concept and fill it with more characters. Well, then you would get the Mandela catalog. I can't do an analog horror video and not talk about one of the biggest on the platform, a series that has built such a big fandom that it even has fan games spawning over on itch.io. Games you can see me play soon over at CyberBlaze. Just hit the i card and hit subscribe, maybe hit the bell as well, just do a lot of hitting and you'll know when the channel launches. Mandela Catalog, similar to Local 58, derives a lot of its horror through its world building. And man, does it create a dark and twisted world. However, I'm getting ahead of myself. The Mandela catalog is dripping in biblical themes. Our first monster even comes to us through a distorted VHS of Beginner's Bible, an old VHS series telling stories from the Bible and sent me straight back to Sunday school when I saw it. Anyone else have that? Leave a comment down below and validate that I wasn't the only one bored out of my mind there. The first monster is introduced to us as an angel. What angel is unclear, but clues thus far have pointed towards Lucifer. I, the, the hit TV show on Netflix. Yes, YouTube, I'm I'm talking about that show and not the one down below. Things though start to take a bit of a wild turn as shortly after we're introduced to alternates, basically doppelgangers of people in the Mandela catalog. Oh, but wait, another turn. People are game overing themselves after being afflicted with metaphysical awareness disorder. Essentially, you go crazy from learning a truth about your own reality, but wait, there's more because there is an intruder and his ability is to abduct children through the TV. Next, they'll be telling me there's ghosts. I still hear the meows of my old cat, Johnny, but the little guy passed away a few years ago. Oh, come on! Mandela Catalog's world is all sorts of crazy. Watching the first half of the current uploads, well, it's a bit overwhelming to take in all the information. There seems to be so many different forces at play that is, until Mandela Catalog Volume 2. Now, yes, the ghost cat clip that I played before was a bit for the meme, but really, it's the inciting incident of this specific story. Something that drives the characters of the episode into a twisted trap. Maybe it's a trap. I, I think it's heavily implied to be a trap. Volume 2 of Mandela is still shrouded in mystery, and we'll definitely get those theorist senses on high alert. That's really what drives the plot here. Mandela Catalog is very much a series that does take more analysis than the other analog series in this list. Sure, it's not as ARG heavy like we saw on Local 58, but re-watching older episodes when a new video drops really helps in contextualizing the story. Visually though, as much as I like Mandela and its world building, it really does lack compared to its peers. Mostly comprised of various still images, there's not a whole lot visually to look at. That's not to say the visuals don't hit you with that level of dread, but things just aren't as engaging. It really relies on the interesting world to get you to want to pour over every image. If anything, this feels more along the lines of a visual novel game, where it's not quite a game, but relies on the story to push things forward. And here, it definitely works, but part of me really would like to see just a little more oomph. Overall, I love the world building in Mandela Catalog. It does such a great job of creating a lived in world where the consequences of alternates feel real. I honestly can't wait to see what Volume 3 has in store. Matter of fact, as I'm recording this, I just saw on Twitter that he posted a teaser, so oh, it's coming. If you want to talk about an absolutely impressive analog horror series, look no further than Backrooms by Kane Pixels. This series 
is from top to bottom incredibly well done. The Back Rooms is based off the original creepypasta about an alternate dimension that runs alongside our own. If you're one of the unfortunate few, you may no clip your way through reality and find yourself in the Back Rooms. I know, I know that probably sounded like bathrooms, but but it's the back rooms. But but can you imagine falling through reality and just kind of appearing in a, a giant room full of toilets? Simply put, the back room series has some of the most impressive visual effects of anything on this list. Kane has gone through the painstaking process of creating a full winding maze that stretches for what seems like forever. I'm gonna be honest with you, I have no idea what he's doing to create all this. I can see a few things, but man, I'm not sure. My guess is a combination of real life locations, still images, a few 3D models, green screen. Look, this is just a long winded way for me to say the production value is absolutely insane. Most people are familiar with the first video featuring someone no clipping into the back rooms, but the greater story focuses more on the research teams from Async. And I'll tell you right now, Async gives me some big UAC vibes from Doom. Why can't we stop messing with portals to another dimension we don't understand? <laughs> Shut up. The back rooms feel the most like a documentary than any of the other videos on this list. Rather than interruptions or hauntings on the tape, the focus is on the findings of the Async research teams. And I've gotta say, I've never been more frightened of a scribble. Now, some episodes exploring the back rooms can be a bit slow. A lot of the early videos feature a lot of walking around. However, it does play up the tension rather well. There's something truly unsettling when you look down the hallways to the same thing for miles on miles on miles. Could you trim some things out? Yes, maybe you could, but you would be missing the feeling of seeing just how massive the back rooms are. The focus really does seem to be on the mystery of the sentient scribble. With episodes hinting at what exactly it is while others lay down the foundation, just a little construction joke for maybe the uh, three construction workers watching. Anyway, laying down the foundation of what exactly is going on with the back rooms. There's a lot to digest with the series, and it'll be exciting to see future episodes. But building a portal is one thing. What about creating an entire world? Let's get back to those gaming-inspired analog horror series. And hey, Kirby just had an absolute banger of a release this year, so why not talk a little Kirby? Our mouth cake! Game of the year! Let's talk about TMK an analog horror series inspired by this very real Kirby commercial. TMK. TMK. Too much Kirby. Think you can't get too much of a good thing? How did I not find this ad in my weird gaming commercial video? TMK is a rather short series, so let's talk way too much about it. Unlike our previous entries, let's start on the visuals here because they're the first thing you'll notice and definitely the highlight of it. I've seen some pretty good YouTube animation, and this is some of the smoothest pixel animation I've come across. While there are some shots that are taken straight from the game, most of this is animation with Kirby sprites, and it is smooth. Let's just take a moment to look at Project Super Kirby Bug Report TMK.exe. In this, we see a phone call with what we've basically been seeing in the other previous videos, portrait boxes with text-to-speech and captions. But look at this hang-up animation. All right, now welcome to Dan Gushes about good asset manipulation. The phone really does look like it's being hung up, but look at this frame by frame. We see the guy on the phone, then when the hangup begins, the asset is slowly skewed to mimic the motion of a phone receiver being put down, then hard cut to the phone compressed and snapping back into place. Play it all together and you see the motion of the phone being hung up without having to see the receiver being placed onto the phone. It's creating smear frames from something that isn't even happening. <laughs> ah, right. Um. In summary, there are so many solid animations in this series that are just so nice to look at. That being said, TMK is absolutely chaotic on your first watch. Stop, stop, slow the heck down. I cannot keep up. There is so much happening on screen that you can't fully tell what's going on with a single watch through. This is an analog horror series that must be broken down shot by shot. So with that, let's talk about the story here. 
which honestly is one of the easiest stories to follow. I say this not as a fault, but as a breath of fresh air after trying to solve Local 58 and Mandela. The videos lay out really nicely that during the development of Kirby Superstar, the devs discovered a bug called TMK, too much Kirby. Despite the awareness of the bug, the game is shipped out. Of course, surprise, surprise, the bug starts corrupting kids who want to game over themselves so they can join TMK's world. Season 1 of TMK seems to be mostly focused on Donnie, one of the devs that found the bug early on and was trying to warn the higher ups. And oh boy, does the futility of being an undervalued employee hit real hard here. The story is definitely more straightforward than the rest, which is saying something since each video clocks in about a minute or less. But when your videos are this short, you have to be concise. And honestly, for the sake of this video, I'm glad it was short. Can you imagine trying to shove years of lore building into something this short? So here's Needle Mouse, which is about Sonic.exe that's been around for frickin' ever. Needle Mouse is a newer one that has been suggested to me. Now, we've talked about Sonic.exe before. Way, way back, I played the original Sonic.exe game, which technically was an updated version of the original original based off the original creepy but you get it well as of late sonic.exe has had a resurgence in popularity thanks to friday night funking mods and as expected the evil god would of course find its way into the analog horror genre needle mouse is a rendition of the classic sonic.exe creepypasta which similar to squimpus's fnaf tapes definitely adds a lot more context to the original story much appreciated a, a tip of the hat to you shut up jojo well that's a username for this video though, I'd like to focus on the first season since season 2 is still being uploaded. This is the main part that really adds context to the original creepypasta. Rather than Haunted Sonic CD is Haunted, we get to understand what is happening with Sonic.exe, why all the characters are being game overed in this story. It all begins when Sega builds their American studio. Unbeknownst to them, the building was built on top of the burial site of Sarah, a college student accidentally killed by her friends and buried here to hide the murder. She goes on to possess a version of Sonic. Then, like any vengeful spirit, she moves on to kill her friends and bring them into the game. You know, like usual. If you couldn't tell, Season 1 functions as the origin story of the haunted Sonic CD from the original creepypasta. It's an interesting take on the original story and told really well. Between this and TMK, they're definitely the most clear stories. Visually, it is kind of hit or miss. I say this only because I edit for a living and I nitpick everything. I am so sorry, shut up Jojo. Some of the tapes have heavy VHS effects that tend to make the text hard to read. Plus, the Sonic Act font from the first game is a really hard font to read when there's a lot going on. That doesn't mean it never gets creepy. There are some twisted scenes in here, specifically the Eggman scene in the beginning of the finale with the, um, with the missing eyes. Overall, this is a fantastic retelling of Sonic.exe. If you're a fan of Sonic.exe and the thousand renditions I can't keep up with, definitely check this out. This next one though, I'm fairly certain you already know. Once I started taking a look at the Squimpus tapes, everyone immediately suggested I should check out the Baddington tapes. And oh boy did we, nine episodes, that's... That's a lot for this channel. Now, before we jump in, I understand there's been some controversy surrounding Baddington. I'm not here to weigh in. I'd rather just stay in my lane of reviewing the actual art. So that being said, Baddington has been a big part of this channel and we should definitely break it down. Baddington is definitely the longest analog series on this list. Each video is 5 to 10 minutes and nearly every video has a secret video hidden in the description. There's even a secret video to a secret video to a secret video. That's too many secrets if you ask me. Now, while Bannington has done some analog horror featuring FNAF and has redone some of Squimpus's tapes with honestly stunning animation, I want to focus on the Harmony and Horror series that is his original work. Harmony and Horror Season 1 is a freaking ride. The story feels similar to FNAF, but rather than just animatronics, it revolves around a toy making company M&A Harmony Toys. The story follows the Greywinder family. Martin and Arthur Greywinder team up together to form M&A Harmony Toys. After the company is largely unsuccessful, Martin stumbles across a dark ritual to bring them success. 
it works, but I mean, this is an analog horror series, so it has to go terribly wrong. Martin, consumed by the power of the ritual, begins to use it on his family members. Driven by madness and jealousy, he ends up trapping the spirits of his brother and his own children into the toys he's created. This series is definitely the most heart-wrenching series we've talked about, with one of the most heartbreaking parts coming from the recent The Perfect Pet tape. Look, it almost made me cry, no joke. While the story is great, this was one of the series that required the most digging after watching to understand. It may have been just me, but keeping track of the characters was fairly difficult in my watch through. You may now leave a comment saying you completely understood it on your first watch, and don't forget to hit the bell on the way back up. The story is understandable, don't get me wrong, just expect to do a bit more deep diving in this series to understand it. Also, captions on. Visually, Baddington's tapes are simply the best animated. It's especially the later stuff. I know we weren't going to talk about the FNAF stuff, but look at this chica hunting in the bathroom. It's terrifying and it's so good. It's this, Backrooms, then TMK. Baddington has a talent for instilling terror into anything he animates. And it's not just him. Harmony in Horror is one of the few analog horror series to bring on other animators, and it shows. But now that I've gushed about how great it looks, Let's have a quick conversation about pacing. Harmony and Horror Season 1 suffers from issues with pacing. While the animation and jump scares are excellent, some of the tapes could be cut down by a minute or three. For example, 1, 2, 3, Count With Me features Ice Cream Man teaching kids to count to 10. It is slow, and the payoff just was not worth watching the whole thing. There are just moments that can be cut down significantly, and in the end just aren't. However, Season 2 has already addressed a lot of this issue. While the tapes are still on the longer side, every part feels important to the storytelling. So Baddington, better not see a counting video again. And if you do, you better spook me good. Despite some recent controversy, Baddington really does have what it takes to go the long haul. The stories are packed with emotion, and the animation is absolutely stellar. The same can also be said for our final analog horror series. Out of every analog horror series I've seen, The Walton Files has garnered the most attention from the platform. Theories, reactions, breakdowns, and fan art for the series have been everywhere. And there's definitely a reason for that. Created by Martin Walls, The Walton Files follows the story of Jack Walton and Felix Kranken, co-owners of Bunny Smiles Incorporated. Definitely taking a much bigger chunk of pages from FNAF's book. But what I really like here as opposed to FNAF, we actually get an inciting incident, something that actually sets into motion the terrible events of the Walton Files. Rather than bad man is bad, everything starts with Felix, who makes the terrible decision to drink and drive. Felix had just picked up Jack's kids when the expected happens. In the crash, both of Jack's kids are killed. Felix buried them, starting a cover-up that would result in even more murder, which of course, leads us to animatronics being possessed. The fact that we're not just dealing with another crazed serial killer is a nice touch. The story now feels heavy with guilt and relies more on the haunting of past mistakes, something I constantly feel because I decided to cover FNAF fan games once. It's worth mentioning that most of the series revolves around Sophie, the only remaining child of Jack Walton. Sophie has no memory of what happened. After the accident, she was put on beta blockers to help with the trauma, which ended up blocking her memory. These tapes function as the haunted spirits trying to reach her to help her remember. This is most obvious in Bunny Farm, a let's play of an old Bonds Burger video game in 1982 with graphics like these. <sighs> I guess we should get into it. Let's talk about the visuals. The Walton Files has been criticized for feeling very amateurish. The animation art style is fairly crude in a way. Though as you watch, crude definitely is not the best way to describe it. Martin's style is very unique and really shines when we get to the more twisted stuff. I mean, just look at Bond. That's him, normal. 
that's gonna haunt my dreams. You either love the art or you hate it. There doesn't really seem to be an in-between. Personally, I've come to appreciate it. It's definitely part of the style for me. The rawness of the art plays up the horror aspects, but I will say I can understand why someone might write off this series. That being said, passing on the series based on the raw art style would be a mistake. Each episode is packed dense with the lore and storytelling. Things are a bit clearer than Baddington's story, but there's still plenty of digging to learn more about the world. That being said, The Walton Files is an absolute must if you enjoy analog horror. Analog horror is one of the most interesting genres to come out of YouTube. The nonlinear storytelling leaves a lot to theorize about, but more importantly, it's got some good spooks. Whether you like it dark and full of jump scares, or you like to sit in that tension of a hostile environment, there is an analog horror series for you. And hey, if you're still here, uh, why don't you go ahead and uh, hit that subscribe button? You could even uh, like this video or perhaps- Ring the bell, because I'll be seeing you very soon. Until then.